Okay, guys. Um, that, of course, the bongos, that was a telephoto lens from uh, a single that I have from, and I'm showing my age on this one, baby, uh, from way back when. And uh, that was uh, also included on the album, uh, Drums Along the Hudson, uh, the uh, official full-length debut of a band called The Bongos out of Hoboken, New Jersey. And uh, that that band was uh, a big, big thing in uh, my life and many of our lives, apparently, by some of the stuff I'm getting hit on on Twitter and Facebook. And um, since I said I was having their uh, lead singer and uh, songwriter and arranger and great, great guitarist Richard Barone on the air with me. And we do have him right now on the air. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for joining us on Finn's Revolution. Of course. My, my, it's my pleasure, of course. Yeah, absolutely uh, great stuff. Before uh, Telephoto Lens, we did hear uh, My Wildest Dreams off of the uh, Phantom uh, Train album. But before we get to how Phantom Train uh, came about or was rescued or whatever the case is, <laughs> can we talk a little about the uh, founding of the bongos in, in Hoboken and uh, how that all came about? You were in a band called A, I understand. Yes, you know, it was a very um, unplanned, sort of spontaneous uh, situation in Hoboken where uh, we had a group called A with Glenn Morrow, who then went off, off to form the individuals and, and found uh, Barn on Records. But the band, that band didn't last very long, six months or so, and somehow the the the, uh, the three other than Glenn kind of bonded and and bo- uh, banded together as the Bongos in a very sort of natural way, just because we kind of you know just wanted to try some stuff out. And I had been writing some new songs that the guys liked, and um, we were using Maxwell's as our rehearsal space in the back room. That was soon to become the, you know, Maxwell's, which is, we we know what we think of, Ma- of Maxwell's is the back room, but at that <laughs> time it was not, and that was our rehearsal space. So it, it was all, nothing was really um, planned or scripted. We just kind of just went uh, along as we did and uh, formed the bongos and, and got signed really quickly to a British label, Fetish Records, which got us over to England to perform and tour all of Europe before we toured the United States. And, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting and, and, um, and very spontaneous time. Again, you, it's something you really couldn't plan. It's just what, it just happened the way, uh, the way it happened. Yeah, and the nice thing about uh, your sound, I, th- I think the first thing, I don't think Telephoto Lens was the first thing I heard. I think it was in the Congo. Was that on that first ah. EP? That was the next record, yeah. The, the follow, uh, that was the third one, I believe. I, I, or second or third. Because, you know, Telephoto Lens was, was done um, as a demo, I think, originally. Um, ended up being the single on Fetish, the first single on Fetish. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, but In the Congo came out as a 12-inch at first, so you might have heard that. Yeah, and I think, did, did it come out as a 12-inch before Drums Along the Hudson came out? Yes, it did, yeah. It did, right, okay. So that's when I first heard you, and then I went backwards a little bit. Okay, awesome. so, um, uh, yeah, and a great, great sound. Uh, uh, you know, always, you know, uh, sort of in the time, you know, certainly huh? sort of a pop new wavy thing, but huh? with so much edge to it at the same time, along with that pop thing, and, it, and just amazing combination of things. You know what it is to me? that We were always, and I still listen to the radio. I mean, I really like to hear what people are doing. And I don't ever want to copy it, but I like to know what's going on. So the bongos were very of their time, but yet we didn't really try to imitate any other group. Exactly. I, but in our mixing, the way we had the drums up front, there's a certain aspects of the technical, I'd say the technical aspect of it, was something we just wanted to make sure that we were could be heard alongside bands on the radio at the time. So... Technically, we were listening to others, but I think musically and melodically, we were pretty unique. Yes, and that's absolutely the case. And, and of course, you, of course, having a wonderful, wonderful, clear voice, very not not quite, uh, you know, in the mold of some other bands that uh, maybe were on the New York scene and, and uh, certainly the New Jersey scene at the time, which were maybe a little rougher, a little more uh, uh, emulating punks. But uh, you guys were like a real solid pop band by yourselves thank you well we really worked on our vocals so frank and i both um on the bongos records we sing a lot of unison and uh, um occasional harmonies together and you know we wanted to have good vocals we didn't really as rough as and as rough and ready as we wanted the music to be we really uh, liked the idea of having finesse finessing the vocals you know and sort mm-hmm. of a, a, having having serious singing on the records you know so that's kind of that did set us apart in some ways i'm not sure if that was always the the uh focus of other groups but ours were were Definitely on the vocals and the performances. 
Yeah, and your guitar playing, always great. Now, do you still have that original uh, Rickenbacker you played for years? or no? That one was destroyed. That one actually got destroyed in the music video, making the music video of River to River. Oh, so that was, that, that was actually destroyed there? <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I wrote about it in my book. It, was, it right. just got completely, like, dr- dr- drowned, <laughs> drenched, and uh, was never the same after oh. that. That was because just what a great guitar, that, guitar right? yeah. that, but you know that was a sacrifice that was truly a sacrifice it's a beautiful video though <laughs> it, is. <laughs> it is i insisted on, on using my own instrument and in that not everyone else did not i mean uh, jane used a, a prop cello that we rented you know and everyone had fake instruments but i i wanted my real rickenbacker in that and um you know it, it was a good and bad thing i i, miss, I missed it at the time but it, it turned me on to switching over to Gibson guitars, which has been a really important part of my, my sound for the last several years now is uh, working with Gibson. I work closely with them. They're newer models, and I use a Les Paul special on most of my recordings. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that it kind of – that somehow that event of the losing of the Rickenbacker made me uh, sort of uh, – developed my relationship with Gibson Guitars closer, and, I, and I'm thrilled about that. Yeah, and of course you've been, uh, uh, and we can get to this later if we want, but intricately involved, intimately involved, rather, with uh, Gibson's development process and yes. and the digital uh, Les Paul and all those different I things. Use, yes, I use a digital Les Paul. I, used the three, I have three different dig- digital Les Pauls, and they're just amazing, wonderful instruments for me, yeah. Yeah, and you're a great, great player, and that's something that that's something that very often doesn't, uh, you know, people think of, you know, the bongos, and they think of a certain kind of a pop sound or this, that, and huh? the other thing, not thinking about the musicianship the, on everybody's part, but you as a guitar player, especially, just just uh, absolutely uh, blistering. Some of those solos you came out with, uh, uh, is there an extra guitar thank player? Thank you, on this? thank you for saying that. Well, all the guys are great. I mean, Frank's an amazing drummer. You know, you really couldn't ask for a better bunch of musicians as the bongos. Uh, uh, came together because the, everyone is so unique. I mean, Frank comes from sort of a jazz drumming background, but he was able to you know, understand pop to play what we needed to do with the bongos. Rob plays all kinds of music, all styles. Right. And of, of course, uh, later when James joined the group, he's an amazing, was a, a great uh, foil for me on guitar, very different from my own style, but yet a, a nice, a really nice mix. Yeah, so so the bongos uh, come out with uh, the EP. They come out with a, you guys come out with a single or two there, right? And the twelve inch, and not a single or two. We cut several. You know, I'm talking about with drums along the Hudson around that time, right? Yeah, yeah. Everything that was on drums along the Hudson, I think pretty much all of those were. Singles. Everything wound up, right? I think we had. We did like maybe seven. There were maybe seven singles. Maybe. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah, because the Bull Rushes was a single, and the Congo was a right. single. Mambo Sun was even a separate single. Uh, Mambo Sun is actually the. Uh, was that one of the highest charting uh, cuts you did? It was. It was. Yeah, on the dance charts, by the way. Uh, <laughs> was uh, it really? The, um, <laughs> No, I think there were almost, many of them were singles, and and in England we put out uh, singles and EPs. We didn't really want to put out any LP, and we did not for the first, all that first material in England came out as EPs and and singles. It was only in America that uh, labels did not want to do EPs and singles. They wanted to do 12-inch LP. And that, uh, we went to Marty Scott's uh, gem label and did uh, Drums on the Hudson there as a, a sort of a compilation. Now, I understand that, uh, just as a quick side, that uh, Gem is actually uh, reforming. Is that correct? Well, yes, because, yes, and the Phantom Train, of course, is on Gem now. After all these yeah. years, we're back with Gem Records, uh-huh, J-E-M. Right, and you guys, are you guys the first uh, first release for the refounded uh, Gem, or, or are there a few other bands on the label right now? No, that's it. For, oh, it. I believe he's doing some signings. I'm not sure what, what he's announced yet, but, yeah, we were the first. And he's also um, uh, distributing... My, my uh, Cool Blue Halo album, the uh, special edition that came out last year on right. Dixon Records, uh, Marty Scott's Gem Records is now um, distributing that, as well as the uh, 25th anniversary concert album, which is a three-disc set, which I'm really proud of. Right. And we'll get to Cool Blue Halo in a second. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. And Gem, what a great label that was uh, back in the day. And I'm so happy to <laughs> Well, I knew of them before I ever signed with them because I, in college, you know, was... Uh, uh, a record buyer, and eventually ended up working at my record store off, off campus in Florida. And um, all the imports came from Gem, so I was really very familiar with their logo. Right. And um, when we had all this material on Fetish for the UK, I, I somehow knew it was going to end up on Gem somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a perfect place for you guys. And and uh, yeah, the '82 release, drums, drums along the Hudson Festival, just uh, that was that was the absolute clincher for me, as, as I guess it was for a lot of people. But it just it was just this massive thing that we played all the time. And I used to go see you guys all the time back then. Um, and then uh, time, then you were kind of back uh, on fetish directly with uh, Time in the River, right? 
Or was yes, but Time in the River was the that was sort of an eight song EP. That was right. a very expanded EP that we did, and we we were in England at that time uh, touring. So that was a great a, a great time. And since they didn't really know the Hudson so much, there it was, became Time in the River. We retitled. We we might have used drums on the Hudson put the title in England, but they wouldn't have known what the Hudson was as well. <laughs> so we changed it to Time in the River. Right, but that was an EP version, right, right, right. It was. Yeah. And then and then Numbers with Wings, which is an absolutely great little EP as well. We I really like the idea of EPs. Uh, I still do, and I might even do one soon. I was talking to a Swedish label about maybe make, doing an EP very soon. But the thing is that um, for vinyl, especially uh, when when we did the uh, in the Congo Mambo Sun EP and, and, and in England, um, you know the various EPs, and then finally on RCA Numbers with Wings EP, you could make it sound much louder, much deeper, and much better because the grooves are so much larger on an EP than if they're crammed, if you cram 20 minutes on a side, you're going to get very uh, squashed together grooves on a record, on exactly vinyl. Exactly right, right. And the EP is just so much better sounding sound-wise. So we were thrilled to do that first EP for RCA. People ask me now, you know, did we feel like che- cheated that we couldn't do the full album? And no, really, those were the songs I had. Those five songs were the newest Bongo song. And we were thrilled that it was an EP because it just sounded so... Awesome. Yeah, and it it uh, absolutely did, and I still have that uh, EP as well, and it it does. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, then then you kind of wrap up your. Uh, I'm just trying to cut to the, uh, the modern stuff here and not take up too much of your time, but. Uh, oh, no, no, I'm 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 happy to speak with you. I'm not sure how you. Uh, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm um, yeah, um, okay. Uh, then there's there's a little lapse of, of recording. Uh, and uh, you're on RCA. You had you had uh, come out with uh, Numbers with Wings. I think was distributed. I think I actually got that domestically. Uh, it was a domestic release, right? Yes, I mean, it was. Yes. Right. And then uh, Beat Hotel came out, which is a whole different turn for you guys in terms of style. Although you guys always messed with styles. Yes. Did you find it that way? That it was a a whole different thing, Beat Hotel. Yes. You know, we started listening to. Um, Again, we had our ear to the ground, and we were listening to what was happening. I mean, we, we really were trying different types of beats. You know, that's why it became Beat Hotel, which was, of course, the, the name Beat Hotel refers to where William Burroughs and so many of the beat writers stayed in Paris. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, on the, but, but we made it our own. We were playing around with so many different things. On One is that, of course, the cover of the album was sort of a, a little uh, illustration of Hoboken and the, the hotel, I believe it was the Victor. <laughs> was the, was the, but we kind of made it like, okay, the Beat Hotel is now in Hoboken. You know, we, we're playing around with that idea. Um, uh, and musically, you know, we started hearing the rumblings of, uh, I, I don't want to say hip-hop, even though I do, because we were listening to the way the bass drum on hip-hop records was not just on the same as it is on rock, of course. It was just more active. And we were trying to create different types of beats that were still rock, but had a flavor of what was kind of just coming around, something new at that time. And we also had been uh, turned on to Brazilian rhythms, and we had a Brazilian percussionist, Freddie Diaz, on that album from a group called Petty Boy, which was uh, playing here in the village at a Sounds of Brazil nightclub. So we were trying to kind of mix kind of Brazilian rhythms and urban rhythms underneath what we did. Mm-hmm. The idea was because we didn't want to just do the same thing over and over. And so many of our friends, and, and, and still, my, so many people, uh, once they make their first album, uh, tend to repeat it a, a several times. Now, commercially, that's a, probably a very good move for them. But we were just in the nature of the, our, the way we wrote and were, we didn't want to repeat ourselves after Numbers with Wings and, and, the, and Drums on the Hudson. We didn't want to just keep cranking out the same thing. So Beat Hotel was a departure uh, on purpose. It was different. Mm-hmm. And really was very experimental in so many ways. Um, the one thing I don't like about Beat Hotel is the way we overdubbed so many instruments. There were so many layers that it's sometimes hard to hear the root of the song. Yeah, it's very, very produced. It's very produced. Now, that wasn't always our intention. But we did one experiment, and um, it was a great learning experience. And, you know, as you, can, as you ask, me, ask me the next question, which is probably going to be about Phantom Train, I will be able to. Uh, I'll be able to go further when you ask me about Phantom Train. <laughs> okay. Be well, able to tell you then why Beat Hotel was important to me personally. Well, you guys shortly thereafter uh, began recording another album, right? 
Yeah, well, we toured all, don't forget, all during this time when you think there may be lapses, we were on the road because we played 300 shows a year. Yeah, you guys were relentless on the road. Yeah, no, I'm not saying lapses like it's like the, no. you guys are hanging out, but <laughs> we were like, you guys were busy on the road. Absolutely, yes. For Beat Hotel uh, was actually our most successful selling record, and the, we couldn't come home because we were in demand to perform everywhere. Right. So we toured constantly all over the country, over and over. We would get home and start over again. Like we didn't, you know, we would finish the whole country and then we'd get and jump on another tour and just keep continuously touring. So um, that was, that was where Phantom Train came from, was that tour. Okay. So tell us about how it started. So while I was writing songs on the tour bus, you know, the Phantom Train had the title and everything was, was sort of conceived on the tour bus while we were on the road with Pete Hotel. Okay. I started like My Wildest Dreams and all of these songs, Phantom Train, of course, the title song, and others I was writing in the back of the tour bus um, along the tours, you know, and Jim would come in and we'd write and we'd jam and, you know, write a song uh, occasionally as well. Um, but we came home from the tour. We actually, we did a lot of recording of, of demos and things, uh, but when we got home, we um, immediately, almost immediately started recording Phantom Train without a break. Okay. Started in New York at RPM Studios, I believe, and then also in New Jersey at Mixolydian. So we, we had all these studios going where we were re- re- recording and compiling tracks, and we ended up in the Bahamas. <laughs> okay. At Compass Point, um, at, where we really did most of the tracking of the album, as you know, the album that finally came out now. The thing was, we didn't really finish everything. <laughs> we were, I would say, in a way, wiped out because we had just come right, like I said, right off the tour, right into the studio and were fried in many ways. Right. Um, and when we came home, there was not a strong focus or desire to go through all the recording we had just done, which was a lot. I mean, let me tell you, because I spent my last, this last summer putting this album together and there were multiple, multiple, multiple takes of every song, <laughs> multiple mixes of every song. There were maybe 30 reels or more of tape. Wow. Maybe more. And, you know, they all had to be baked, by the way, because that's, that's what happens to old tapes. Nice. Um, but there was so much to go through that none of us really wanted to do it. We started doing other things, and I started performing in, in the clubs here in the village where I live, uh, you know, just as a little uh, trio with Jane Scarpantoni on cello and Nick Celeste on vocal and guitar. Mm-hmm. And I did my own thing, and Jim started his own thing, and pretty soon we all had our own projects going on. <laughs> Yeah, so it wasn't, there was never an official breakup of the bongos. No, not really. We were actually still doing occasional concerts, big shows, and and, uh, short tours in between there after, um, you know, after the recording of Phantom Train. But we didn't, none of us wanted to face all of those tapes, and it was almost, it had become tedious because we had so, we had done so much stuff, organizing it just got out of control. Right. So we never finished it, and then I... Did cool, when I finally recorded Cool Blue Halo, which was from a live concert here in the village, mm-hmm. uh, I was uh, I got uh, on tour. I went on tour with Suzanne Vega, like it was the, it was Richard Barone and Suzanne Vega on tour. She had just had a record out called Luca, and she had like mm-hmm. we were playing theaters all over the country. That tour for me went on for two years. Okay, came home from that. I got signed to MCA, right? And I made Primal Dream. So there was by that point, Phantom Train was a distant memory. Right. It was kind of shelved, at least. It was shelved. In my shelves. My shelves. My apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Phantom Train has been staring me in the face for the last, you know. It's just been on my, it's, on, it's been on my shelf, like, as, as tapes, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know how it came about that then Marty Scott, being at the Cool Blue Halo 25th anniversary concert, which you have not asked me about yet, but you will, <laughs> he was at the concert, and I opened that show with my wildest dreams, all by myself with my guitar, that's how that uh, concert opened. Right. And Mark asked me about that lost album. And we started the process of putting it together soon after. Okay. But it took me years. I don't, I'm not going to count them because I don't believe in time. <laughs> but I will say that it, there was quite a gap between the recording of Phantom Train and the release of Phantom Train. Right. It really became a phantom. <laughs> well, let me ask you now, since we're discussing Phantom Train specifically, and then we'll go back in time a little bit, but okay. Phantom Train specifically, uh, you know, Maxwell's closing down just this year. Yeah. You guys doing the uh, the last gig at the place. 
Uh, was this an impetus? Did you, was this all coming together at the same time, or was, was this just serendipitous? I think it was serendipitous. Okay. No, it, we didn't plan that Maxwell's was going to close. We had already been starting to talk about and plan the release of Phantom Train. Okay. Marty Scott asked me last year, um, after the Cool Blue Halo 20th anniversary concert, he asked me about that album, and I said, yes, it, it, yes, it exists. It's not, a, it's not a fantasy. It's a real album. And um, we started talking about it, and then we started working on it earlier this year, way before we knew Maxwell's was, um, was going to be closing. Okay, just... The, the, the date for the single, which was ironically the day after Maxwell's closed, was already set before oh. Maxwell's closed. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, because I just thought you guys just might have been inspired at that moment knowing this was happening, and... Uh... We're not that smart. We're not that smart <laughs> in marketing. We, we, uh, we're, we're not that... Also, in, uh, we're, not, we're, we're sadly not very opportunistic. We just, you know, we usually do... Like I said, the Bongos never really plan things. It's just it's what happens naturally. Right, right. That is another example of that. We had been talking about releasing that song on August 1st before we knew that Max was closed on July 31st. Wow. Wow. It's right. serendipitous, but that's a bongos theme. The bongos <laughs> are very serendipitous. Very good. Um, all right, so the, so the bongos kind of go their own way. You do uh, Cool Blue Halo. Yes. And, uh, of course, as we just discussed, uh, you, you know, you've, you just had the 25th anniversary of Cool Blue Halo, and that's a spectacular collection just right there. But Cool Blue Halo on its own, did, did you feel like uh, when you were first recording, you know, this is your first record under your name, Right. Uh-huh. Did you feel like uh, out of sorts? Or did you feel completely comfortable at the time? It was a combination. It was a mixed emotion. Um, I had always been, you know, with the. I really had only performed with the bongos, really, a for a very short time. But that was also the bongos anyway. Right. Uh, so it was different. But they were all very supportive. I believe Rob was in the audience, and uh, the bongos. And I, you know, I think, you know, I felt supported. We, it was very low key. You have to understand when I was started doing solo shows, it was extremely low key, and I deliberately didn't replace any of the bongos. That's why there's not a bass player, and there's not really an electric guitar player, and there's not really a drummer. You know, there's a symphonic percussionist, there's a cello player, and there's Nick Celeste, who's so hard to define, but he's not really like an electric guitar player. You know, he's an ac- he played acoustic and sang. So I wasn't replacing any of the bongos. I, that was a very deliberate choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't want to feel like, okay, I'm, not re- I'm replacing Rob now or I'm replacing Frank. It was ridiculous. That's not really, that was never my uh, thought. You know? So the idea was, okay, I-, I want a different kind of band then. I'm not going to compete with them or myself. Here's something different. And it was um, another approach at playing some of the same, a few of the same songs, um, certainly a, few, a couple of Phantom Train songs, at mm-hmm. least one, Tangled in Your Web, and I Belong to Me. Mm-hmm. We're done on that album. And a couple of bongo songs, Numbers with Wings and the Bull Rushes, mm-hmm. those two. Um, and then covers that I wanted to do. It was very you know, carefully laid out. I had a dream at one point that Mark Boland came to me, and he, I, was working, I was planning to make that album, and I had a dream of Mark Boland telling me, are you going to make just a collection of songs or is this really going to be an album? <laughs> I thought, okay, that's an intense thought. I, so I thought, so I sort of said, okay, let me take Mark at his word, and I sort of putting together like a serious, like um, structured album. The the three pillars that hold it up are the three cover songs: Beatles, Bowie, and Bowl. Right, right, right. And then I picked two or three bongo songs, three, three I believe, that also are the sort of the secondary pillars. And then you know the new material, which I squeeze in there, either from Fan Train or brand new material that I had just written. Mm-hmm. All really structured. But it was never to compete with the bongos, of course. I wouldn't want. To, I wouldn't have wanted to. No, and also the uh, the arrangements, every every the approaches you took were completely different from the angles you took with the bongos. So yeah, I sang so differently too. I sang in a Absolutely. different way. I was really inspired by Peggy Lee and some of the jazz singers that I was getting into, that were from previous eras. You know, that's really the inspiration to the way I sang on that album too. It's a little more like. I don't want to say Billie Holiday, but I will say Peggy Lee and um, Chet sure. Baker. You know, this kind of jazzy, kind of cooler approach to singing, not the on fire all the time approach that the bongos had. Yeah, and you brought that onto Primal Dream too, which is that it's that same kind of, uh, uh, which is actually my favorite. And I hate to say this, but because uh, I, I hate to say this to somebody I'm interviewing, but, but my favorite but, solo album of yours, Incomplete, is actually you know, Complete Album is Primal huh? Dream. I love Primal Dream. 
I like it too. You know, my favorite of the complete albums is probably Glow. Glow but is yes, I, gorgeous. I, I love um, Prime. I like them all. They're all different. I mean, uh, Clouds Over Eden was a very important record for me, yep. um, which came after Primal Dream. Um, that one is a very of a piece. Also, those were all connected. All those songs were very connected. You know, yep. those, that's my most conceptual. I think album was Clouds Over Eden. But they're all different, you know, so really it's like I'm happy that you like Primal Dream. I do like it, too. I think it's a really crisp al- uh, sounding album. I was thrilled to work with Richard Goddard again, who had done Numbers of Wings, right, and, and Don, Don Dixon, Dixon, who I knew through R.E.M., but the, who's always a good buddy of mine. I was happy to have him produce half of that album, too. So that was a Primal Dream was definitely a great experience for me. Yeah, uh, a gorgeous thing, gorgeous thing. And I think that was a real touchstone between the albums, too, you know what I mean? Almost... Uh... I don't know. It sounded like a, if, if you listen to them in order, like Cool Blue Halo, Primal Dream, and, and uh, Clouds Over Eden and Glow, it sounds like uh, Primal Dream is very much a transitional record as well. Do you feel that? Primal Dream? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Well, it was like it's now bringing in the rock elements again because I had completely gotten rid of them. Exactly, right. And I was like easing the back end, yeah. You know, it, my, the first three albums are my Star Wars trilogy. <laughs> It's, you know, A New Hope is Cool Blue Halo. <laughs> the Empire Strikes Back is Primal Dream. And The Return of the Jedi is Clouds Over Eden. Very good. <laughs> I like that. And, of course, a very successful uh, series with Cool Blue Halo uh, on the 25th anniversary concert, which Thank is you. just gorgeous. And the DVD of that is also beautiful. And, uh, I was thrilled to make that. That was a very serious project last summer. That, see, both my last two summers have been like I've had no vacations because last summer was uh, putting together the Cool Blue Halo 25th anniversary concert with Matthew Billy, my, my producer on that record, and my collaborator in so many things uh, that I've been doing uh, in the last few years. But he, he did an amazing job of capturing that live show and making it sound studio quality. It sounded great, but it also, you know, you, sometimes there's a, there's a give and take with the final product, and the DVD also looks great. Yes, that's an amazing film crew we had. I think there's a five-camera crew from Comedy Central that filmed it. Yeah, it's beautiful. And um, they were all over the place, and I didn't even know it. Like, they were, I, how did they get on stage behind me? I have no idea. I didn't sense them on stage at all. I still don't know. I still don't remember seeing any cameras on stage. But if you look at that concert footage... It's surrounding, they're surrounding us and me um, from every angle and filming really just exactly what we're playing. It's very uh, precise filming. Yeah, and the editing is just gorgeous on the, on the DVD. Beautiful. It's beautiful. beautiful. It, was, it was a major process, though, because we were, you know, we were sending them the audio files and to, to sync everything up, you know, was, was, uh, it's a miracle how it all works because, you know, we had a whole different recording, but it synced up, of course, perfectly, but they were, their cuts and everything were so intricate, so many cuts, and showing Jane's cello playing and right. my solos and uh, Valerie Naranjo's uh, vibes the, on, on the notes she's playing. I mean, it's really a miracle that it, that it uh, that they captured everything. Yes, it's a, it's a beautiful, everything. beautiful thing. And I recommend anybody out there who just wants to, uh, hey, look, just learn quite a bit about uh, uh, about Richard. Uh, cool Blue Halo, the 25th anniversary concert, is, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. A Thank you. The documentary is very well, uh, well made. That's with, uh, by Justin Martell, who made the, uh, the story of Cool Blue Halo, which is really also my right. story in, in a nutshell, too, on that album. Um, it's the most deluxe package I've ever done, I think. I mean, certainly this the most content that anything I've ever done, uh-huh. you know, on that, in that box, that little uh, Kubu Halo 25th anniversary box set, you know. Thing. Um, so, so now, um, uh, Phantom Train is, is out. You guys have gotten together, obviously, at different times. It's never been a bongos breakup or a long period of time. No. It's been, periodically, you guys have gotten together for different things and done some uh-huh. gigs. But uh, now are you going to be going out uh, full on the road in support of this record or some select gigs or what? I think select like gigs here and there. You know, it's like, again, it's tricky because everyone does their own thing. And Frank, uh, our drummer, just got married on Saturday this weekend. Oh, well, congratulations to Frank. Yeah, it's exciting for him. And so, you know, we all have different things. But, yes, you know, I'm a professor also at NYU's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music. Yep. And I, but this still, that doesn't stop me from, of course, touring. I tour all the time. As a solo artist, I'm on the road all the time anyway. Uh, sort of, I think of myself as a troubadour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's really my... That's my live show. Uh, when I'm on my own, I tell stories like I'm telling you, but also, you know, it's, it's with songs. Um, but yes, there will be some bongo shows here and there, and if not everywhere, certainly here and there, you know, uh, wherever possible. Um, we, we're thrilled to play this year at the CMJ Festival in New York. Mm-hmm. That, 
um, also filmed uh, filmed and recorded for Sirius XM for the uh, their you know for for a broadcast soon the entire concert. And who knows? We may even find a way to release that concert. It was quite good, and uh, that might be releasable at some point as well. So, yeah, I think we'll be doing more. That every show's exciting. Every show's um, it's like every every time we do it, it's like doing it for the first time for me. Wow, that's that is great. That is exciting. Um, now, I have a I have a few questions that have been relayed to me. <laughs> Okay, via good. Twitter and Facebook. And well, you know, people can also come to my Twitter. If they ever want to, re- after this interview, too, if they ever want to visit me on Twitter, I'm a Twitter, uh, I Twitter, I tweet all day long, and um, <laughs> I'm on Facebook at, you know, Facebook slash Richard Barone official. Um, any, any, any social media network that exists, I'm on it. Very good. <laughs> well, anyway, one of the, one of the questions I also shared uh, was uh, you had you had I want you I want you to tell me a little about this experience too your your years as the uh, music director of the Downtown Messiah, right? Um, can you at the at the bottom line you know R I P and all the rest of that? Um, tell us a little about uh, how that all came about. How you got involved with the Downtown Messiah? Which uh, actually tell us a little background on that if you can. Well, I didn't get involved with that. I created it with uh, the bottom right. line with Alan Pepper. It was his idea. And because uh, he just he, well, he his, his idea was not the downtown Messiah. His idea was how can we present Handel's Messiah here in this nightclub? Mm-hmm. And I had to. I asked him to please give me 24 hours to think about it, and I'd get I'd tell him an answer the next day, which I did. <laughs> but the idea of the downtown Messiah, which was to have all the arias, which are the solos, done in various styles representing music of Greenwich Village. That were, that were prominent in Greenwich Village, either now or in the past. So we did blues, folk, rock, jazz, you know, et cetera, pop in my case. Uh, and so each time there was a soloist, they would, the solos would do a song in a different style. This is the only production of the Messiah in the world that's done this way. Right. Because usually, even if there's a, I know that Quincy Jones, my, one of my friends and mentors, uh, did a version of the Messiah at one point, but it was all R&B. You know, soul Messiah, which is awesome. But ours was that plus every other genre that would have been found in Greenwich Village. Which is every genre. That was my, that was my, <laughs> what I brought to the table as far as that. And then we, we went through the Messiah and kind of picked out elements that were both New and Old Testament. So it didn't lean too heavily on the Christmas story you know, or too heavily on the concept of Messiah from the Old Testament. It was both. It was like 50-50. Uh-huh. Because that's really that was what made ours very unique. It wasn't necessarily the most traditional of Christmas messiahs. It was like the idea, the concept of a messiah, and also you know, in, in, in some of the music was was very related to the Christmas season as well. So it had both elements. It was very good. It sort of satisfied a, uh, people in that way, which I was was something I wanted to do. Um, and we had some amazing performers, from David Johansson to uh, uh, Jane Sibbery. Um Oh, my God. There was just like an endless. The, the Kennedys, my good friends. Yep. Uh, every, every solo was done by each year by a different person. Even if they returned, they often did a different aria, so it was never the same show. And it ran for seven years at the bottom line. And it was broadcast each year by uh, Public Radio International. Yep. Mm-hmm. So we got a lot of WFUV was the sponsor station here in this area for that show. Right now, I, I wasn't the musical director. I was not the musical director. I was the director. I took that as a theatrical piece, and I uh, considered and my title was director. Now there was a choral director, Margaret Dorn, and there was a musical conductor. That's uh, Peter Kieswalter. Um, so it was like a triumvirate there. Of the we kind of each had our role, but mine was the overall director of the concert. So it was a, it was a very theatrical presentation. Absolutely. It was a wonderful thing. I went to two of them myself and it was absolutely fantastic. I got um, to wear some really great costumes. I kind of <laughs> saw myself as Ziggy Stardust in that. <laughs> and you were. <laughs> it was absolutely and great. I did bleach my hair blonde for the Messiah. That's right. Well, I don't know. If, did you bleach it blonde for that or you just had your hair blonde at the time? Started doing it for the Messiah. <laughs> okay. There you go. Now, is there any chance that in the future that uh, that comes back to uh, – Back to the well, yeah, it, every year we, I have offers to do it. The problem is finding a venue that see, it was a huge production, and you saw it, so you know. Yep. It was a gigantic production, and the venue that we, where we did it allowed us to move in there. They closed for the entire week, and we could put that show together the way that you do a Broadway show or something. You don't just come in for the night like a one night stand. You do you move in. Right. And the bottom line allowed us to move in and do that show. So since 
since then, people say, oh, can you come do the Messiah? I say, yes, we can. Give us a week and we'll do it. But no place can do that. Right, right, right. Find the right venue that will let us do that to move in, build a stage the way we need to do, because we had to build a stage for that each year. I mean, I didn't build it, but they were builders coming in to extend the stage for the set, because for the orchestra. I mean, you know, no nightclub can handle the Messiah. Literally, <laughs> there's a pun. No nightclub can handle the Messiah. <laughs> A N D E L. No, because it's it's a big it's a big deal. But if someone could present us a, a venue to do it in, we will do it again. We you know, we all want to do it. So club owners out there, if you want to make Richard uh, an offer in New York City, uh, give him a call. Absolutely, you can find me on <laughs> Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> that would be a wonderful thing for you to put on again. And I would love to. I would. It's a beautiful show, and I love singing in that. You know, it it definitely stretches my vocal cords to places I've never gone before. <laughs> And the yeah. choir was great, and the orchestra was great. It's a wonderful show. Yes, absolutely it is. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, you mentioned uh, the great uh, Jane uh, Scarpantoni, and, and you uh, shared her uh, uh, talents with uh, several other artists, including Lou, yes. Reed, including Lou Reed. Yes. And uh, who she also did wonderful, wonderful work with. Absolutely. Um, if you don't mind, uh, you know, I know Lou is a, a friend of yours. We've been doing... Uh, as everyone has, I guess, uh, constant uh, reminders and constant playing of his uh, music. And, you know, everyone's had their brush with Lou Reed and all these different things, but you, you were a friend of his. Yes. And uh, could, could, you, could, you, could you speak to uh, what kind of, I don't know, I don't know if you want to talk about the loss or the gain of having him here, um, but speak, speak, speak about Lou Reed. Lou was, to me, the consummate artist always. Before I met him, while I knew him, and looking back at his life now, he was the consummate artist. Um, when I grew, grew up, when I was growing up in Florida, and I heard not only the Velvet Underground, which I love, but his solo work, all of it, the nerve that it took to do metal machine music, the power he had at, as rock, on the Rock and Roll Animal albums. There are two, of course, uh, albums from that concert. Mm -hmm. um, the creativity that he showed on albums like Street Hassle. Um, he really covered it all. He was a consummate artist to the very, very end. I was texting with him up to his last week. I saw him. He's, well, okay, I, I saw him with Mick Rock, and I did, I'm going to uh, add to that in a second, at John Barbados' store uh, on Bowery only two weeks before he passed away, I think. Um, signing copies of his new book with Mick called Transformer. Um, he was active and creative in everything for his whole life. I saw him. He would, we were very close friends in many ways, but one is that he always alerted me to his various other projects he'd be doing. Like occasionally he would like, uh, do live guitar playing to score a silent film, for instance. This is, these are already under-the-radar things he would do because he was constantly creative. You know, and I would go see him do these various things that were really not the commercial rock gigs. They were very unusual things. I got to work with him on a few shows myself. Uh, one was um, at a concert I produced uh, in 2010, I believe, at the Hero Ballroom in New York. And I had um, Sonic Youth, Lou Reed, and the filmmaker Kenneth Anger, an amazing bill. Um, this was a benefit for the Anthology Film Archives, on mm -hmm. which I'm on the board of directors, board of advisors, I guess, I guess uh, more correctly. But Lou, again, did a scoring for a silent film there, and it was breathtaking. See, what I'm, my point is, he was a consummate artist. It wasn't just one thing. Even though he's known for, of course, Walk on the Wild Side and these, you know, that the image of the the post velvet underground Lou Reed, yeah. but he was a true artist. It's, it's going to be an inspiration for me. So, you know, for my entire life. And it has been for most of my life. I met him when I was 18. And um, I'm, he was one of the first major artists that I, that I had met because he was in a guitar shop. He loved guitars, of course. Mm -hmm. He was a genius of guitar tones. And he was in a little store called We Buy Guitars on 48th Street. And I was in there to buy my Rickenbacker that you were asking about earlier. Huh. Well, that Rickenbacker was pointed out to me by Lou Reed. Huh. He was in the shop. I was in there to buy a guitar because mine got destroyed in my trans, my trans, my uh, train tra uh, travel from Tampa. My Les, my uh, Gibson L6S was destroyed in the, on a train ride somehow. So I was buying a new guitar, and it, he just pointed out the Rickenbacker for me. Not that he even played the Rickenbacker, but he thought that would be good for me, and he was absolutely correct. <laughs> that became my Rickenbacker. It was in 1965. <laughs> 
So I met him then. Of course, you know, that was like, thank you, you Lou, I really love your music, blah, blah, blah. But then we became friends when the bongo signed to RCA. He was also on RCA at that time. Right. And he loved Numbers with Wings. And I loved the sound of Numbers with Wings. And contacted me by telephone then. And we started a conversation that lasted for the next, well, you know how many years, because it's, it, never, it never ended until he died. And a lot of it had to do with, uh, he loved technology, getting that amazing sound that he got. Listen to his records, they are amazing, his guitar sounds. Well, he was obsessed with that. And we would talk about how to get guitar tones and stuff for just hours on the phone, you know. He taught me a lot. He taught me what, who to work with as far as engineers. He taught me what studios to go to. And he often would ask me who I was working with. And uh, after we made Beat Hotel, if you notice, his next album was made by John Jansen, who had just done Beat Hotel for us. Huh. That's because he asked us about that. He, he, wanted, he wanted to do a record of that sort of type, where we did different drum things and you know, used, used some machinery and stuff that we did on that album. Right. So, you know, we were very intertwined in a very subtle way, in a very friendly way, all those years. He ended up living on my street here. I didn't see him much on the, in the neighborhood, but he li- we lived on. He lived right on my same street here in the village. Wow! But he did write me a note when he saw me do "I'll Be Your Mirror," um, that I saved forever, and it was just like it was. A, he had to get my address because he didn't know my address. So he had to find out where I lived and to write me a, and mail me a card that just simply said, "I love your mirror, Lou." Wow. So that was my endorsement. I've done that at every single show I think I've, that I've done since I've gotten that note. Wow. And, and you can't get uh, a greater endorsement than, uh, than that right there from Mr. Reed. No. And he's, you know, he's always been, he was always so supportive of everything. I played at Carnegie Hall in 2008, and Lou was traveling with his Berlin show. But, so he couldn't be at the show on that day, but he came in and we filmed him reciting I'll Be Your Mirror for me. Oh. And I had that on the screen at Carnegie while I played the song with Jane down on the stage. Wow. So we had an ongoing creative relationship that lasted a lifetime. Oh. But he's, he's, he's the real deal. He is, you know, it's like the Beatles. It's yeah. Lou Reed. I mean, he's, he's up there with them. I mean, Brian Epstein wanted to manage the Velvet Underground. Don't forget. That right. was the next band he wanted to sign. Yeah, it's a uh, a great great loss, and uh, but an inspiration to us all, obviously. And yeah, we'll miss him, but you know, it's all it's all about the art, and he was an insp- truly an inspiration. Yeah, the music is out there, and it's it's available, and that's a great thing. Matter of fact, you know, one thing we were listening to a lot uh, here uh, last week was some <clears throat> tracks he did <clears throat> on his tour with Laurie Anderson in Europe. Yes, which of course is not commercially available anywhere as of this point, but. What beautiful, beautiful stuff. I believe he did I'll Be Your Mirror on, that, on those shows. Uh, at, towards the end of the shows, right? Because that's when he did, like, regular... So, think, yeah, songs, yeah. yeah. Uh, Laurie was great. And I knew Laurie separately. You know, I loved... When the bongos just started, she, she was a recording artist at the time doing... Um, um, she had a single on an indie label. It was Oh, Superman, I believe. Right. Do, do you remember that? Of course, yeah. Yeah. So I knew her back then, and then we went to the same gym. I'm in the, you know, I'm a villager, and they were vill- – Lou and Lori both in the village. So she went to the same gym I used to go to. So I'd see, we'd work out. You know, I'd see Lori. I'd just wave to her and say hi. John Kale was at that gym also, so it was, it was, it was a strange uh, rock and roll gym, you know. <laughs> That's right. I, I knew Lori from, separately from Lou, anyone I liked her. So it was kind of very nice when they got together. And I, I'm sure – did you, well, I'm not sure, but I hope you read her, her – um, her piece, and I, I think Rolling Stone ran of that. Of course, her, yes. Beautiful, beautiful piece. It, amazing. Really yep. beautifully written, and it really <clears throat> lays it all out on, in that article. I recommend that article to anyone who, who loved Lou to read yeah. that. And they seem to be a wonderful fit together, and uh, if anyone can die uh, peacefully and happy, it seems like uh, he did. Yes. Yes. Which is a good and he, feeling. Like I said, he, he never stopped working and creating, ever. Right. All right, Richard Barone, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, we're going to leave on a positive note here. Uh, well, you know, it's all, all it's of that all is positive. positive, too. All of that is positive. It is. It's Lou, but wow, what a legacy he left us. Absolutely. Phantom Train, the sort of new old release by the Bongos, finally put together, uh, being mixed for, I don't know, 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Everything in its time. It's now time for Phantom Train. It's kind of fun having it now because it's like a lost, you know, it's like, 80s music is popular 
now. I mean, you know, there are a lot of, I get everything that Sony puts out, for instance. A lot of these bands, like churches, and even, you know, some of these bands that I listen to that are, that are new bands, they have so many 80s references, oh, not course. to mention Daft Punk and these others. Oh. I'm oh. telling you, there's so many 80s references that it's kind of fun to find a real 80s album that you've never heard before. <laughs> Now. That's right. And it is a great, great record. And, and uh, right now we're going to uh, uh, use some of those as premiums that I happen to have on hand great. Uh, for our fundraiser. Richard Barone, a pleasure, pleasure to spend some time with you. Thank you for spending time with us here on WUSB Stony Brook. And uh, great, great to talk to you. Great to reminisce about Lou and, and uh, uh, tell some stories about Lou there. And, and best of luck with everything. And we shall uh, be speaking to you very shortly. And we'll see you at the next show, my friend. Thank- Thank you so much. And visit me, you know, your listeners can visit me on uh, rich, at richardbarone.com. And if, if they want to sign up for my list, which I, I it's, you know, geo targeted, so you get, a, you get an email when I'm playing in your area, that's right on my website at richardbarone.com. You can just do a list, the list sign up. Easy to remember, richardbarone.com. Check it out. Richard, thanks so much for joining us on WUSB Stony Brook, my friend. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care.